All right, let's get started. Um, so I'm just going to start with some simple announcements. First, I'd like to introduce the head TA, Tom Trigger, who is a graduate student in my lab. Mm -hmm. you want to say a couple things? Uh, uh, sure. Uh, some of you have probably heard from me via email already. I'm a fifth-year PhD student and a sociologist, as Nicholas said in his lab, or Dr. Christakis. Um, if any of you need any help with anything in the class, feel free to reach out to me or the other TFs who I'm sure you'll meet soon. Um, and just keep me posted if you're having any issues. Sound good? Okay. Thank you, Maggie. We'll introduce the other TFs next time. Uh, we're going to be doing Section 8 using the online tools. We're going to begin that at the proper time. Yeah, at the end of the week. At the end of this week, and the first sections will meet until the third week of the class. We're going to be podcasting these lectures. So uh, we're going to try to do that. I mean, the video call is not great because we're doing it from right here, but you can see the slides and me. We're working on making the optimal audio quality. So if you missed the first lecture and you want to see it, it will be online typically a week in arrears. We'll also be posting all the slides uh, a week in arrears. So like the beginning of next week, we'll have this week's slides. It'll be posted on Canvas probably. And exams going back since this course was first offered, like 10 years ago, are posted on my lab website under teaching. Uh, if you scroll down, you can see all past midterm and final exams uh, is part of our sort of transparency uh, policy. Um, I would encourage you to look at any conflicts you might have with the current exam dates as they are on the syllabus for any foreseeable conflicts. I'd rather you let us know now rather than the day before that some long anticipated event conflicts uh, with the exam. Okay, so uh, typically at this moment I would ask you if you have any questions for me. But I suspect, is anyone bold enough or have a question from last lecture? I, I'm going to really work hard to get you guys to talk in lecture uh, and give you opportunities to talk to me and answer questions and so forth. We'll be using clickers as well. So I'll have you guys use clickers to answer questions sort of quietly without necessarily raising your hands. Any questions from the last lecture? Yes. What's your name? Uh, my name is Taylor. Taylor. So you're just skeptical about modern medicine. I was just curious as to how it came about. Why I'm so skeptical? Uh, it's a combination of my medical training. So as I was taking care of patients in my 20s, as I sort of became a doctor, I became keenly aware of the fact that a lot of times the things we did seemed to be very late in the game. The patient was already sick from all the stuff that had happened to them before they came to the hospital. And it sort of strained for Julie to me that these things we would do at the end would make a big difference. I would also see the kind of problems that medicine will often introduce, this notion of doctor-caused injury, which in three or four lectures we'll talk about. And, uh, and then I also, as I kind of learned more about the social determinants of health, I became intellectually more committed to the idea that the primary determinant of what makes people healthy or ill is not modern medicine, it's uh, social factors. And you'll be learning about that. And I hope I'll persuade you with the weight of evidence of this belief. It's not just an ideological commitment. I believe it's an empirically grounded commitment. But I struggle with it a lot. I still struggle. Because I am a doctor. I did take care of people. I had an unbelievable experience of saving people's lives. Like I did it. Like I went into the room and I did something that saved this person's life. And you know, so how can I be skeptical of it? Well, you'll see. It's complicated. Other questions? Also, the other thing I wanted to mention is that I know it's shocking period, and uh, I know the first lecture is pretty dramatic and it's deliberately so to sort of engage you and interest you. Uh, and then this lecture is not a downer exactly, but it's a little more technical. So if you didn't see the first lecture and you're shopping in class now, this is not typical of the lectures that you'll see. By the third and fourth lecture next week, we'll be back to a kind of more, a bit more vivid, uh, engaging kind of material. But today we're going to talk a little bit about health, to how we measure health, uh, so some broad patterns. It's an important foundation for a lot of the things that we're going to be discussing uh, later on. Okay, so first of all, I want to stress again that this class is broadly synthetic of the social sciences in medicine, and that it is both qualitative and quantitative in its orientation, and that it occasionally, therefore, involves allusions to biological and medical concepts and some simple math, and much of that stuff is here at the beginning of the class, and I have no doubt that you can handle it. But again, knowledge of biology and math is not essential for this class, and of course, I'll be glad to answer any questions you know, as, we, as we go through. Okay. So last week we discussed using suicide as an initial example. We contrasted personal 
and collective ways of understanding or studying illness, medicine, and death. And we talk about the different ways, more generally, of understanding social phenomena. So towards the end, we introduce this idea of methodological holism and methodological individualism. How do we understand group level phenomena? Do we have to go down to the level of individuals, or can we study groups uh, as, a, as a whole? And we describe the ways that the practice of medicine differs than the practice of public health. We saw some, some introductory statistics that are going to kind of orient us in this class. We saw, for example, that human lifespans have increased dramatically uh, over the last century, at least in the United States, and that life expectancy at birth for women has gone in the last hundred years from 48 years to 80 years in one century. A uh, historic rise, never before seen in the history of human beings, that's happened just in the lifetime of your grandparents, where there's been skyrocketing, skyrocketing longevity in the United States. An amazing achievement. And we were also introduced to some basic ideas about the social patterning of longevity and causes of death. And we saw, sort of in an introductory way, that how long you live and what you die of appears to vary not only across time, but also across socioeconomic attributes. And we introduced some phenomena that we'll be considering in this class, such as neighborhoods, institutions, networks, and so on. Now, in this course, we're going to be engaging the implications of the structural opportunities for individuals. And this is a long-standing debate in the social sciences. Does your fate depend on your own choices and actions? Or does your fate depend on the opportunities and constraints that you are given or that you face? Does it depend, in fact, on what other people around you are doing more than on what you yourself are doing? And this is the tension and the difference between structure and agency. And of course, both are important. And the extent to which each is important in any particular outcome is often contested philosophically, theoretically, uh, empirically, pragmatically. People don't agree. What really explains whether someone lives or dies in a particular uh, situation? So, um, so in the case of health, these questions are actually quite important. What determines health? Is it individuals or is it the environment? Who's responsible for this? And these questions, in turn, raise obvious moral and policy considerations. How we answer these questions then leads almost inevitably to proposals about what we're going to do about whatever state of affairs that we might find. And behind these questions is the question of whether medical care really makes any difference at all, going back to the nihilism you were asking about. <laughs> so consider this, for example, as another introductory statistic. The United States spends more on health care than any other country, but it does not have the best health outcomes by any means. For example, in, as of 2016, we spent an average of $9,403 per capita, and the United Kingdom spent about a third as much, $3,377 per capita. And the people in the United Kingdom live longer and have fewer medical problems than we do by far, even accounting for differences in age and race distribution um, and so forth. So just to give you a feel for the sort of outlier that the United States is, take a look at this graph. Um, one of these is not like uh, the others, right? So if you see the United States, Here's the United States on the, on the x-axis is health spending per capita, on the y-axis is life expectancy in years. Here's the United States, way over here. We spend more than anyone else, but we're not better than many, many other countries. So for example, we spend just as much as, uh, as England does, that's right there. In this, uh, I'm sorry, we have the same longevity as England does, but as I said, something like a third of the spending. And Japan, which spends just as much as England, has even better outcomes, even better survival uh, than the United uh, Kingdom. And understanding and explaining some of these differences is going to be one of the objectives of this class. Now, one argument, uh, or one of the arguments that we'll be making, is that while biomedical care might be effective in acute and inpatient settings, in chronic disease and in outpatient settings, it's much less effective. Thus, a focus on access to health care, which is an obsession in our country, ignores the most important determinants of health, namely the patient's sociocultural context. And this can lead to many misguided policies. And in fact, I would argue that to improve the health of the population, physicians must serve as advocates for improved social conditions, public health initiatives, general and health education, and behavioral interventions. 
Okay, so one argument to explain the American healthcare paradox of why we're spending so much more but getting so much less is this. So as shown, we spend by far the most when one looks at just at healthcare. So for example, here's what Japan spends. So this shows these are countries. And on the x-axis, it shows per capita spending. This is a different year, measured in slightly different ways. But the bottom line is here's the United States again, a top outlier, spends more per capita than anyone else. For example, here now compared to Japan. So why is it that we do worse for health? Well, one resolution of this paradox can be found when we broaden our vision on, with respect to what we are spending our money on. So for example, if you look at how much social spending, how much money is spent on social supports in addition to health care, you get a rather different story. In OECD countries as a whole, for every $1 spent on health care, they spend about $2 on social services. But in the United States, for every $1 we spend on healthcare, we spend 55 cents on social services. So the point is that total spending on health and social support is actually higher than those other countries. The reason they are getting so much more benefit for seemingly spending less money on health is that one theory, a claim, it's not proven. But one idea about why this might be happening is that they're actually spending so much more money on other seemingly non-health things, but getting health benefits as a result. So here's the total spending uh, on health and social care combined, and here's the United States uh, sort of in the middle. We spend more in blue on health care and not very much on social supports, but these other countries, even though they spend less on health, when you add in all this other social support spending, they're actually spending, in fact, much more than us which may be why they're living longer. So indirectly, this is also a clue that actually maybe healthcare isn't what's prolonging longevity. Some spending on other things, other aspects of the patient's environment or the people's environment may be important to the health outcomes that they experience. Maybe. Now, as we introduced the last time, life expectancy has changed a lot in the last century. So this slide was a key slide from the last time. This is the year since, uh, you know, the last 100 years. This is life expectancy. The women are in, in, uh, in uh, red, and the men are in, in yellow, and the solid lines are at birth. And you can see that life expectancy in birth has increased dramatically in men and women, you know, by 60% or something in the last 100 years. And life expectancy, if you reach age 65, so 100 years ago, if you reach 65, you've got another 12 years to live. Now, if you each reach age 65, you have another 16 or 18 or 20 years to live. Uh, so not as many total years gained, uh, but that's because, in fact, the benefits that have accrued to prolonging life have accrued because of what we've done to reduce mortality at early ages in young people more than uh, older people. And in fact, the maximum human life expectancy has not changed. And this may be, and this is likely, because there are intrinsic biological constraints on the upper limits of human life, as we discussed the last time. And if you note the variation by gender here, women are very privileged in this regard. This is very unequally distributed. Women live longer than men by far. Uh, and you know that's socioeconomic stratification in this, uh, 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 a gender advantage to women uh, in this regard. So, um, so US life expectancy increased for most of the past 60 years. But the rate of increase has slowed over time. And in fact, in the last few years, since you guys have been in late high school and college, life expectancy in the United States has begun to go down, which is really weird. That has not happened very often before. And a major contributor of this has been increases in mortality from specific causes, specifically drug overdoses, suicides, and disease related to the obesity epidemic. So Americans are getting more depressed and more overweight, and those are now at levels that actually Americans are dying earlier than they did even uh, in 2014. And this is seen in young and middle-aged adults of all racial groups with an onset as early as the 1990s, and the largest relative increase is occurring in the Ohio Valley and in New England, actually. Life expectancy declined from 78.8 years in 2014 to 78.5 years in 2016, uh, which is you know, just unbelievable, actually. For someone like me, who's been studying public health for the last 30 years and talking about improvements around the world, with economic development, and life expectancy, this is a very weird and un uncommon and depressing 
uh, finding. Nevertheless, this increase in life expectancy, or the decrease in mortality, is actually part of a much larger phenomenon known as the health transition that was described in 1971 by Abdel Amran, and that's in your readings. So let me just spend a few minutes on this, because this is a sort of a macro-historical change that's a very deep and fundamental thing to understand about what's happened. What happens as societies industrialize? What happens as scientific progress occurs? What happens as we become richer and as knowledge distributes throughout the population? How is it that the structure of the population, the life expectancy of the population changes? This slide shows on the x-axis here some arbitrary value. This could be 50 years or it could be 500 years, okay? So some number of years. And on the y-axis is measures of different sorts of things. For example, the crude birth rate, CBR, the crude death rate uh, per thousand people. So this is the, uh, the, crude, uh, the, crude, uh, the crude birth rate is, in, uh, is in, uh, in blue, and the crude death rate is in red. Crude death rate is here, it's in red. And this is the total population that's shown in black. And there are four stages, famously, of the health transition. So this shows at the top here are some sort of thumbnail indicators. Socioeconomic development, not so much. Much more, much, much more, much, much more. Life expectancy at birth goes from 30, 30 to 50, 50 to 55, and greater than seven years. And then diseases, what are people dying of? And at this phase, they're dying of acute infectious diseases, and by here, chronic diseases, and here, mental diseases begin to burden the population. So what's happening here as, as societies change? Well, this phase, stage one, the pre-modern phase, is called the high stationary phase. And this characterized the human species for hundreds of thousands of years. You had very slow population growth. Like, over, it took 1,000 years or 5,000 years for the population to double. You know, in your lifetime, if you lived more than 10,000 years ago, there was no growth in the population in the area where you lived. Death rates were high, and birth rates were high. People, young babies died in, in droves, and people didn't live very long. Adults died. And so there was a balance between births and deaths, which is why it's called the high stationary phase. Birth rates and death rates are both high, and why there's not a lot of population growth, because these are matched to each other. The death rate and the birth rate are matched uh, to each other. And this, this was the state of affair, affair in human populations across all time until the late 18th century when the balance was first broken in Western Europe. Birth rates and death rates were both high, about 30 to 50 per thousand, very slow population growth, as I mentioned. And death rates were very high at all times for a number of reasons, including a lack of knowledge about disease prevention and cure, food shortages and famines, and the impact of extrinsic causes of death, like accidents and diseases, and so forth. And then something happens in any country, but the first time it happened was in Europe in the 18th century, was the society begins to urbanize and industrialize. And the first thing that happens, when that happens, is that the death rates begin to decline. Okay? So people stop dying. And they stop dying for a whole host of reasons. They stop dying because there are improvements in the food supply. There's all kinds of new ideas as in agricultural practices about crop rotation or selective breeding or seeding technology, or uh, fertilizer, for example. Also, there's the introduction of plants that were discovered in the, in the New World. So maize and potatoes that were found in the Americas were brought back to Europe and become staples in Europe and are very useful to feed the population there. These new crops increase the quantity of foodstuffs in the European diet, especially in uh, Northern Europe. And we begin to see as well during this period significant improvements in public health that reduce mortality, especially in childhood. These are not medical breakthroughs. Rather, they are things like improvements in the water supply, or sewage handling, or food handling, or personal hygiene, like the invention of cotton underwear, for example. I mentioned that the last time. Uh, and from growing scientific knowledge about the causes of disease. And we begin to send women to school in Europe in this period of time, and increasing female literacy a lot of the public health education programs also play a role in declining mortality that you see in stage two. And as a consequence of this decline in mortality in stage two, you get a rapid rise in the population. So 
So death rates are going down, and now all of a sudden population begins to explode. After millions, after hundreds of thousands of years of very low growth, in, you know, in the lifetime of your grandparents' grandparents, suddenly the Earth's population begins to explode in a way that never previously um, had been seen. And, uh, and, and, and therefore, uh, we, and this reflects the fact that, the, that the, the gap between the death rates and the birth rates is getting wider. So this growth is not due to increase in fertility. It's not like people are having more babies, but rather to a decline uh, in deaths. And finally, another characteristic of stage two of, of this epidemic or this, uh, this health transition is a change in the age structure of the population. In stage one, before this transition, the majority of deaths was concentrated in the first five to 10 years of life. And therefore, more than anything else, the decline of death rates in stage two entails increasing survival of children, and as a result, we become more youthful. Our societies become more youthful in stage two. Well, what happens in stage three? Well, after a long time, decades, maybe a century, of, uh, of uh, people no longer dying young, people begin to realize they don't have to have as many babies. So the production begins to be curtailed. And there are other developments, which I'll highlight in a moment. So now, the death rate has come down, we're in stage three, now, lagging, the birth rate begins to come down. This is the third phase of the health transition that societies around the world have gone through in the last few hundred years. And several factors are speculated to have contributed to this decline in the uh, birth rate. In rural areas, a continued decline in childhood death means that, that at some point, parents realize that they don't need to have as many children because before you might have 10 children and two would survive to adulthood. Now you realize that you have four children and three will survive. So people begin to have fewer children, which children used to be useful for working in the fields or as a, as a kind of old age insurance policy. As you got older, your kids would take care of you. Increases in wealth also delayed marriage, which reduced fertility. So you, people weren't marrying daughters, young women weren't being married off at a young age anymore. They were getting married later. And the later they got married, the fewer children they had over the reproductive of careers. Increasing urbanization began to change traditional values that were placed on fertility and the value of children in rural society. And urban living also raised the costs of having children. So people began to look more rationally and say, hey, you know, it's expensive to have kids. Before, you know, just as many and couldn't control it. God knows what happened to them and many of them would die. Now people say, well, maybe I don't need so many. Maybe I won't have so many. It's costly. And increased female literacy and employment lowered the uncritical acceptance of childbearing and motherhood as a measure of status in women. So the status of women begins to change as well as part of all of these things. And finally, at least in the 20th century, contraceptive technology was introduced and began to have these, uh, these effects. And, as, and at some point towards the end of phase three, what you find is that the fertility rate falls to replacement levels. And now you have the so-called low stationary phase. Birth rates and death rates are matched once again, but not at high levels, at low levels and then population begins to plateau in the country. So absent immigration or emigration, you get a kind of steady rate or steady population uh, in those countries. But look how different it in some ways, and in fact, there might be other demographic changes that also take place during this stage, such as a change in disability rates or quality of life, or even the gender basis of the society, if people begin to apply technologies to abort female fetuses preferentially as happens very often in India and in, in, in China. So there, there's a, an enormous problem with the selective abortion of female fetuses such that you get gender ratios that are very skewed in those countries, which account for you know, a big fraction of the population on the planet. Uh, and that's another aspect sometimes to uh, phase, uh, phase, uh, three, uh, in, uh, phase four in the population. But if you look, you can see that phase four looks really unnatural, quote unquote, compared to the natural state of human affairs with high death rates and high birth rates that we saw at, uh, at stage one. And in fact, in some countries, you can have fertility continue to decline, so you begin to have populations decline in a particular country. Now, I myself seriously doubt that there'll be a stage five that happens you know, sometime after this, which we might imagine as a kind of age of immortality, 
And we'll see at the end of the course that some people believe there'll be a kind of human-machine fusion. There'll be technologies that we, we create cyborg humans, or we use genetic engineering technology, and we'll come to this, such that actually now we get a very different thing that happens, completely changing, you know, as we begin to live very long uh, than we have been so far. Um, and the fourth, but the fourth stage really does uh, involve a delay in disease and certain other features, including a possibly an increase in mental health and a phenomenon known as medicalization that we'll see more about um, in a minute. Okay, so this is just a basic fact. I don't know, it's kind of boring to tell you about. I don't know, I think it's sort of interesting. Uh, it's, not, it's not so cool for me to talk to you about it, but, uh, but it's just a basic macro understanding of what's been happening with births, deaths, and populations when it comes to uh, the illness burden in societies. And in summary, as socioeconomic development proceeds, mortality and fertility rates shift from high to low rates, populations get larger and older, and the disease pattern shifts from one dominated by infectious diseases, perinatal diseases, and nutritional disorders, to one dominated by chronic diseases and mental disorders. So when you look around you and you see what people have and what they're dying of, it's very unnatural. It's very different than the kind of environment in which we humans uh, evolve. And this increasing life expectancy in the United States is also mirrored by the changing composition and causes of death. For example, cancer has been increasing. Cancer is in dark blue. And influenza and pneumonia, which are in light blue, have been declining. So I think that, that the last time, so this is again in the last 100 years or so, this is the of people dying, what are they dying of by percentage, and different kinds of causes. So the, uh, the light green here is heart disease, and the uh, dark blue here is cancer, and whatever the other light blue, the colors are awful, I'm sorry. Influenza pneumonia is here, it begins to disappear as a leading killer, uh, you know, here's what's happening to heart disease and so forth. So the, the mix of things that people are dying of is changing. So people are living longer, they're dying of different things, but are they the better for it? And this is an important question we haven't considered yet. If I told you that you could live to be 70 and then die, or live to be 70 and then spend five years in a coma or in agony and then die at 75, which would you prefer? Okay, raise your hands if you want to live to be 70 and then drop dead. That's option A. Option B is you live to be 70 and then you spend five years in a coma or in agony and then die at 75. Who would want that? No takers for that. No. Oh, no, one taker. Jacob will take that. Okay. So, yeah, one taker. Okay, so that's typical. So, that, so that's what's happened. If we've been living longer, you see, which I just showed you, we've been living longer, and I just showed you we're dying of different stuff, but maybe we're not the better for it. Maybe, in fact, we're worse off, because all that's happened is, is we've added suffering at the end of life. So actually, maybe we haven't achieved anything beneficial. How can we know if we're actually having that desirable property? This obviously would not be an improvement. So the question is, are we living better when we live longer? And this is covered in, a, in one of the readings for today, a classic paper by Fries from 1980 that outlined three possibilities of what might be happening. So one possibility is, let's say, the present or the previous, before the intervention possibility. You, uh, you, know, you live to be 55, nothing has happened to you, but suddenly you get some illness, you live for 11 years after that, and then you die. And this sort of shape triangle is the increasing burden of being sick during that time period. Well, one possibility is that we just added years of life. So you still fall sick at 55, and we add four years to your life. So now, you do live longer, but those four years are in bad health. And so you have a longer period of time when you are in a bad shape. Another possibility is that just a shift to the right. The total number of years you're sick is the same, but we add healthy years to your life. So here, we've added an extra five years to life, Right in this spot here, you die at 81, five years later, but this triangle is the same duration and shape as that triangle. And a third possibility, which Freeze proposes, which would be the best thing, would be maybe we have a compression of morbidity. We have a later onset of, of our illness, some postponement of when we die from 76 to 78, so actually we are sick for less duration 
even while we are living longer over the course uh, of our lives. And this compression of morbidity is a good thing in and of itself. And in fact, it also has policy benefits that offset the effects of population aging and that offset the consequences of having an increased number of elderly people who need medical care. If we're able to postpone people's lives but not make them healthier, we're just going to increase the burden on society. So we want to postpone their deaths and compress their illnesses so as not to have a bigger burden on our society. Now, one clue that this is actually happening is that over the last few decades, life expectancy and the number of elderly in our society have greatly increased, as you've already seen, but the number of nursing homes has remained constant or declined. And this is indirect evidence for the compression hypothesis. Now, when Fries first suggested this in 1980, that there would be a compression of morbidity, it was far from clear that there would be, and data to test this idea at the population level were limited. But since then, if you, uh, we do have, we've acquired such data, such as this graph showing estimates based on the uh, particular longitudinal survey that's taken from your readings. And what they found was that there was a dramatic drop in disability over 20 years at roughly the rate of 2% per year, which was greater than the decline in mortality in this period, which was 1% per year. So this is the timing of this occurrence. Here's the percentage of people that are disabled, and people, fewer and fewer people are disabled, and that disability is dropping more rapidly than mortality is dropping, which is evidence for, the, for evidence for the compression hypothesis. So people are living longer, they're dying of different things, and they're healthier while they live. In fact, all three of those things is happening. Now when we speak of disability and morbidity or health, we seem to assume that we all mean the same thing, and that we all know what we mean. But even this seemingly simple thing of defining health is actually not so simple. There are a number of ways we could define it. And one way is to define health as simply the absence of, the, of disease. But this standard relies on the failure to detect disease. It is a negative definition that relies on instruments to detect pathology. And it is also simply shifts the problem of defining disease. But another way is to use the statistical standard, which compares people to populations. So this way of defining is how are we going to define disease? What do we mean when we say it'll help? Well, we can say diseases of living organisms are internal states which interfere with the normal functioning of these organisms. What is to be considered normal functioning is calculated statistically with respect to an age group of a sex of a species. So what we say is we're going to just plot a histogram a density curve of some attribute, you know, how tall people are, let's say, or, or how able they are to run fast. Some people are slow runners, some people are fast runners, and then we're just going to put a line there and say anyone who's better than that as well, and below that we're going to say you're sick. That's a statistical standard for divine, uh, defining um, a disease or poor health, right? This is the statistical standard. So by this definition, if you're missing a kidney at birth, probably one of you in a group this size, probably one of you is missing a kidney at birth, uh, which is relatively harmless, or if you're colorblind, and again, probably one of you is colorblind in this room of this size, by this standard, those would be considered diseases, right? You say, oh, you know, that's not normal. I don't care that you function just fine. We're going to label you as sick. Here's another definition. This is the adaptation standard. This says the states of health and disease are the, are the expressions of, of the success or failure experienced by the organism in its efforts to respond adaptively to environmental challenges. So the adaptation standard compares people to their surroundings. It stresses the performance of the organism in its physical, biological, and social environment. It focuses on the ability of an organism to perform given its situational background or its standard circumstances. And so this sunburned man, who appears to be deprived of some IQ points and <laughs> to have deliberately done this, is a poor fit with his high sun uh, environment and maybe should you know, kill one of his older siblings as we saw the last time. More to the point, missing a kidney would not be maladaptive or reflective of ill health by this definition, right? 
So by the adaptive definition, you say, okay, yes, you were born with one kidney, that's statistically abnormal, but you're functioning just fine. Therefore, you are not sick by this uh, way of thinking about uh, illness. So in other words, the standard circumstances can vary across time and place and society to society. And as a result, a person with a particular physical or mental constitution may be able to fit in one environment and not in another. And so, and so may be judged unhealthy in one place, but not in another. And in fact, disability can be seen as a failure of adaptation. If your hip is decrepit, and I replace it, and you are no longer disabled, uh, what would I make the same claim that you're no longer disabled if I give you a motorized wheelchair? Are you now healthy? Do we say, oh, if I replace your hip, you've been cured, but if I give you a wheelchair, you've not been cured. You're still disabled. And if you're deaf, if you're deaf, I say you're unhealthy, but if I give you a hearing aid, you're healthy. Okay? So this, this is the adaptation standard when we begin to think about your fit with the environment. And actually, one can get quite serious about the sunburn example. Here's what happens when you take a fair-skinned set of people and move them to an environment on the equator. This shows the incidence of melanoma in countries around the world. And Australia and New Zealand have the highest rates in the world by far of this deadly disease. It's a cancer of the skin. And the Aboriginal people of Australia do not suffer from melanoma. So it's not just physical aspects of the environment, such as sunlight, that matter. Biological aspects can also be relevant to this fit. For example, historically, Native Americans were just fine in terms of most aspects of their health until their environment changed with the introduction of Europeans and their old world infections. Epidemics of pathogens such as smallpox and measles raged through the population and decimated it. Here is one estimate on the left of the population decline in the population of Native Americans in Mexico from 1518 to 1593, less than 100 years, there's a 90% decline. People are dying, like limited. 90% of people die just because their environment has changed with the introduction of these biological pathogens, okay? So we might now say, oh, they're unhealthy because they don't fit with their environment, which would be an odd kind of conclusion to come to if this is the standard that we use for deciding whether uh, a, a person is healthy or not. In fact, the population declined from 20, 25 million people in 1518 to 2 million people in 1593, most of it attributable to infection. And on the right is another example. This, this graph estimates the population decline of the Illinois Indians for, 100 years later, from 1677 to 1765. And here, over 70% of the decline uh, of, of the population dies in less than 100 years, again, largely due to infection. And in fact, the selection effects, the Darwinian selection effects of these epidemics were so large that genetic analyses today can actually retroactively reconstruct these events in the history of these peoples because they can reveal something known as population bottlenecks. One recent study conducted in 2016 that studied the Chibshian people of Canada revealed that a population crash in the 19th century left clear shifts in immune-related genes. In other words, these epidemics were so deadly and raged at such a clip that only people who by dumb luck had immune systems that rendered them relatively immune to these pathogens survived. And now we see the mark of that in the genotypes of these individuals. Uh, we see, oh, they have a distribution of genes that re rendered them immune that's so narrow that we can use quantitative methods to tell, oh, they must have been slaughtered by this epidemic in a very recent uh, point in time. And in fact, based on this genetic study, at least 57% of the population was wiped out about 175 years ago. And this number triangulates with historical accounts from these people, where they describe the decimation of their population around that time due to smallpox. These are 500-year-old drawings by the uh, Nahua Native Americans suffering an epidemic from smallpox. They, they had not seen these diseases before. They knew them to be unusual. They knew something bad was happening to them. And this is what they drew. And this is a more recent photograph of smallpox, uh, which is, you know, an awful condition which has been eradicated on the planet just in the last hundred years. I have a vaccination from smallpox, none of you do. 
uh, because when I was a boy, the smallpox still was a problem, and there was an effort to vaccinate everybody. <clears throat> now, a third way of defining health is this way. In some ways, disease does not exist until we have agreed that it does by perceiving, naming, and responding to it. This is the social value standard, which compares people to ideals and ideas. How can a disease exist, the claim goes, until we humans detect, define, and name it? For example, prior to the antibiotic era, having a sequela of infections, such as pockmarked skin, was normal and was not deemed to reflect any kind of disease process at all. Well, everyone has pockmarked skin. That's the way human beings are. It's only when we say, wait a minute, something known as smallpox exists, and this is not a, you know, this is a disease type of condition. Or another example would be hypertension. Before the invention of a device called a spindle manometer that could measure people's blood pressure, nobody knew they had blood pressure. There was no such thing as high blood pressure. There was no way to know it until we invent a machine that can measure the thing and we give it a name, and now we say that all these people have high blood pressure or are hypertensive in our society. So by this definition, missing a kidney or colorblindness are only diseases if we say so. And there are many so-called culture-bound syndromes. Culture-bound syndromes comprise several kinds of illness or affliction, all of which are defined as culture-bound in that they do not have a one-to-one -one correspondence with a disorder recognized in Western allopathic nosologies and often have obscure biological origins and that they can be initially reported as confined to a particular culture or a set of related or geographical, geographically proximal cultures. And the existence of such diseases, this culture says, oh, we have this disease. And this other culture says, we don't have that disease. And we, don't, and we Western doctors don't think that that's really a disease. This poses another problem to the definition of health. For example, in Latin America, there's a condition called susto, an mm -hmm. illness attributable to a frightening event that causes the soul to leave the body, leading to symptoms of unhappiness and sickness. What are we to make of that culture uh, groups defining disease in that way? Or in Malaysia, there's a disease, there's a disease called coro, which is an episode of sudden and intense anxiety that the penis will receive into the body and possibly cause death as a result of this. And this syndrome occasionally occurs in local epidemics of coral, where lots of people suddenly are afraid that their penis is going to go up into their bodies. And it occurs in many parts of Asia under different names. It's called Suoyang in China, for example. And there have been isolated cases in the United States and Europe. And the treatment consists of assigning a trusted family member the duty of holding the penis for 24 hours a day to prevent it from being pulled up into the body. This is the recommended treatment, apparently, for this condition. And in fact, you know, we look at this and we think, oh, well, maybe that's sort of funny, but they're telling historical examples in our country. So this, this example, which I've been teaching for years, has re-entered the public discourse recently. Some of you may have seen this example. But in our country, Dr. Dr. Samuel Cartwright, a Louisiana physician and a member of the LA Medical Association, in the mid-19th century named a disease called Dracomania. Who's heard of this condition? Yes. This condition is the insatiable desire of a slave to escape. We're going to call that a disease and label it such, right? This strikes us as insane. How can you know, the disease be something that you arbitrarily call uh, in, that, in that regard? But what about things like back pain? In our country, we think there's lots of back pain, for example, but rates vary widely across the industrialized world. And the biological origins of back pain are very obscure. And many people think back pain in the United States is a culture-bound syndrome. We just think we have back pain, just like the penis vanishing example. And like, unlike, unlike the penis vanishing example where the, the treatment is someone holds the penis, in the United States, when you have back pain, you, you don't go to work. And you get, to, you get to stay home and lie in bed. And that's the treatment in that situation. Some people have suggested that anorexia, which is a severe restriction of food intake associated with a morbid fear of obesity, uh, and sometimes other methods of losing weight, including excessive exercise, is a culture-bound syndrome. It's seen in rich democracies like ours, but doesn't occur in other parts of the world. What's going on with that? And this is one of the things we mean when we say that a disease is socially constructed, an idea we will also return to later. 
So to recap, we've considered four possible types of definitions for, uh, for health. There's the absence of disease standard, which just defines health by reference to its opposite. The statistical standard compares people to the population of their peers. The adaptation standard compares people to their environment. And the social standard compares people to ideals or ideas. And there's one more official definition. This is the World Health Organization definition. The WHO definition of health is, health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And in fact, there are other definitions, which I'm not talking to you about, uh, sort of notions of health as happiness, or the so-called welfare theory of health. And the definition we choose, however, is important, because when we pick a definition, as you see, some conditions get defined as illness and some don't. Depends on which kind of rule we pick. And also because it implies obligations on patients and doctors and society. Is health a personal or a communal good? How can it be measured? And this connection of health to happiness and overall well-being is important for both conceptual and methodological reasons. In part because it's related to this concept of utility. Here's what utility is. Utility refers to the happiness or satisfaction gained from consuming goods and services or, for, or from being in a certain state. People are construed as rationally trying to maximize their utility and rationally trying to be as well off as possible. This is the classic definition of utility in economics. And utility is supposed to be a summary measure of everything we care about. It's thus an expression of our values. And measuring utility and happiness actually is quite complicated and tricky. Many social scientists take a behavioristic view of utility. They see it as a hypothetical construct that accounts for people's observed choices. And in a, in a bit of reasoning that to me, that strikes me as very tautological, they sometimes argue that people are rational maximizers of their own utility. And so by definition, whatever people do necessarily maximizes their utility. So we say, OK, what did you do? You made that choice because it was the best for you. And then we say, what's best for you? Well, it's a choice that you made. And so it's a kind of a circular reasoning. And it doesn't allow for the possibility that people might not be rational in their choices. So I don't take that view. I leave open the possibility that choices that people make do not maximize utility very well at all. And I think that judgments are at least as relevant as decisions and actions. So there's something called the so-called rational theory of addiction. We look at people who are addicts or who are alcoholics and we think, why are they ruining their lives? How could they possibly be making such crazy decisions? Some people that adopt the strict utility point of view say they are making the decision that's best for them. They prefer to use heroin than to have anything else happen in their lives. They prefer to be alcoholics, and therefore, they are maximizing their utility. I reject that view. I think that people are not necessarily making a choice that's maximizing their utility just because that is what they're choosing. So how do we measure utility or health more generally? Proper research and understanding trends in disability and health and in quality of life requires a specification of what we mean and how we measure it. So when we speak about health improvements, what exactly are we talking about? Are we talking about death? And then how we measure death? Is it, is it, uh, is it you know, the mortality rate? Uh, or is it life expectancy? Or are we using physical measures? Are we testing people or examining them? Or disability measures? Are we seeing how fast they can run? Or their ADLs, the activity of daily living, or their grip strength? Uh, or is it self-reports? We ask people, rate your health on a five-point scale. How do you think you're doing? Uh, or their symptoms. We say, okay, we're going to check your symptoms. Do you have pain? Do you have blood in your urine? Uh, are you depressed? You know? Or do we give them vignettes and say, which of these descriptions is most in keeping with what you think your health state is? Or do we use one of these quantitative measures that I'm going to introduce to you now at the bottom, known as the standard gamble, the time trade-off, or visual analog scales? And the question is, what matters? Is it objective or subjective measures? What if there's an inconsistency between the two? Should we privilege people's own perspectives? You think you're ill, but I don't think you're ill. Or the reverse. You don't think you're ill, and I'm like, you're sick. 
you need care. Which should matter? Should it be the subjective experience of the person, or is there some objective standard outside the person that we might go then impose upon the person? Should it be some kind of biological measure? Should we use social or statistical standards? And why should we care? And also there's a question of whose values matter. Do we derive assessments of health states from people who have them or people who do not, from the young or the old, the rich or the poor? And this can matter quite a bit. And one of my favorite stories in this regard is if I asked you, how much money would you pay to avoid losing an arm? Who would pay $100 to avoid losing their arm? Who would pay $1,000? $10,000. Assume you can afford this. $100,000. You pay a lot to avoid losing your arm. I met a man who was a scientist about 25 years ago when I was in training who, I don't know why, but he lacked an arm at the shoulder. And he, could, he was living just fine. He was a scientist. He could eat, drink, manage his life. He had no problems whatsoever. And I, we were, we were friends. And well, there were a bunch of us young scientists at this kind of conference in Florida. And we all got to talking about this topic in a very arcane way. And we said, well, what would you pay to get an arm back? <laughs> and he said $20. And we were stubborn, right? Are you nuts? What do you mean only $20? I don't need an arm. I'm totally fine. I'd pay 20 bucks to have an arm. So when you're measuring how disadvantageous is it to lack an arm, who do you talk to? Are you talking to people with two arms, or do you talk to people with one arm? And you might get a very different answer as to how bad it is to be in that particular uh, health state. Or consider whether we want to know how bad it is to have to walk with a cane. Assessing how bad depends on whether you ask young people or old people. If I ask you guys how bad is it to walk with a cane, you'd say it sucks. If I ask 80 year olds, they say, well, yeah, that's normal. There's no problem with walking with a cane. That's what everyone, everyone does. So the question is how do you measure utility or health more generally? In proper research and understanding trends in disability and health and in quality of life requires a specification of what we mean and also of how to measure it. So let's look at some of these measures in a bit in a bit more detail. It turns out that one way that scientists do this is by doing sophisticated versions of this would you rather game that you guys probably played when you were young. Would you rather have sex with Ernie or Bert? Who remembers these games when you were in elementary school? Raise your hands if you played these games. Some of you did not. Care. Would you rather be eaten by ants or lions? Who would rather be eaten by ants? Who would rather be eaten by lions? Lions win, okay. Would you rather be able to fly or read other spots? Who would rather fly? Three thoughts. It's about half and half. Be three feet tall or nine feet tall. Drool frequently. I'm going to ask you this one. Drool frequently and uncontrollably or be a bedwetter. Who would rather drool frequently and uncontrollably? Who would rather be a bedwetter? Oh my god, I think the bedwetters win this one. Uh, have to always eat standing up or always enter your car from the passenger door. Hate your life but be popular or love your life but be despised. So there are these would you rather game, and scientists have a very sophisticated version of this that they use to measure health. So for example, uh, there's a website that you can go to play such games if you want. So would you rather uh, live in a world where there were no problems or live in a world where you rule? So who would rather live in a world where there are no problems? Live in a world where you rule? OK. So you can go to this website and you can play games like this. Or here's another example. Uh, would you rather be the smartest person or the hottest person? Who would rather be the smartest person? Who would rather be the hottest person? OK. So you can actually go to this website. You can go on this website, and you can make choices between these. Would you rather do this, or would you rather do that? So why am I setting this up? Well, it turns out that scientists use a sophisticated version of this exact would you rather thing to measure health states using something called the standard gamble. How does this work? So the standard gamble works like this. Let's say we want to assess how bad is some health state, OK? Health state A, let's say uh, being in a coma or lacking an arm. How bad is lacking an arm, OK? So we say, OK, in choice A, you're going to be immediately uh, and painlessly transferred to this health state where you lack an arm. In choice B, you will go to this node where, with some probability P, Either you'll remain in perfect health, or you'll be put to death immediately. Okay. <laughs> so, so everyone understand. Would you rather? Would you rather suddenly lose an arm, or would you rather 
have a 0.1% chance of being killed. Do you understand the choice? So this is the game that the scientists play, would you rather, in order to figure out how bad is it to lack a, an arm by comparison to being dead and having a certain probability of death. So then they ask people this question, would you rather lose an arm or have a 10% chance of death? Would you rather, who would rather lose an arm? Who would rather have a 10% chance of death? Who would rather lose an arm? Who would rather have a 10% chance of death? Some people would take a 10% chance of death. It's an odd choice for me, but so be it. That's your choice. These are subjective differences in our, in our preferences, OK? Uh, and so forth. You, you can manipulate this number until finally you get out of who would rather lose an arm or have a one out of a million chance of death. And here, people might say, oh, I'll take a one out of a million chance of death in order to lose an arm. And so would you rather, would you rather, and we go until people are neutral to the choice. And when we get neutral to the choice, we say this choice branch, choice A, is equivalent to choice B. And we say that the perfect health has been defined as having a utility of one, and death is defined as having a utility of zero. So with a little bit of arithmetic, this quantity must equal this quantity, given this probability of the branch point. And we say the utility of health state H is the probability of being in perfect health plus one minus the probability of being put to death, which means that the perfect health or the, the utility of this health state is that probability which makes you neutral. You sort of understand, at least get the intuition behind how this works? I'll distribute this slide so you can do the arithmetic on your own if you want. Any questions about this? All right, so that's the standard gamble way of assessing how bad is it to be in some kind of a health state. Here's another way of assigning the utility of state, again, measured as u sub h, the utility of health state. And so here what we say is imagine that on the x-axis is time, some amount of time you're going to be in a state, and on the y-axis is the health status, and the maximum health status is 1, that's perfect health, and 0 is death. And we say now you can either be in perfect health for some amount of time, t1, or you can be in some lesser health, for example, be on dialysis or lack an arm, for some longer amount of time, t2. Obviously, if t2 was to the left of t1, you were in worse health and lived less long, nobody would make that choice. Right? So now you say, now you begin to vary this time, how much longer do you have to live in the bad or worse uh, state in order for you to be neutral to the choice between these two alternatives? Now measured in time instead of probability. And here's how the method works. You go to people and you say, you're age 50, you have severe arthritis, you're unable to walk, and you're in constant pain. And you must choose between living with arthritis until the age of 80, or living in perfect health for a shorter period of time. And then you vary that period of time, and you ping pong back and forth between the options, varying the period of time. And let's say the person says, you know what? I, I'll give up five years of life in order not to have arthritis or pain. I'll live to be 75 in perfect health, rather than 80 in this arthritic state that you described. Then you do this bit of arithmetic that's, uh, that's described here, where you subtract 75 minus 50, which is the amount of duration of life you've chosen in the bad state, minus 50, the age you are now, divided by the amount of life you would have had, which is 80 minus 50, which you are now, and you compute the utility, which is 0.83. That's the utility of being arthritic. So you basically say being unable to walk in constant pain is 17% worse than perfect health, but much better than death. Or the utility is 1 minus the number of years you're willing to give up uh, divided by 80 minus your current age. And the better the proposed health, the fewer years, of course, that you would be willing to give up. And there's a question. And finally, the visual analog scale is one of the most frequently used measurement scales in healthcare research. And the visual analog scale, um, is, which is a, you know, the one that's most commonly used is for measurements of pain. And you ask the person, where would you put arthritis, for example? And you give, you know, sort of these kinds of polls. You say, okay, you know, where would you put an X? How, how bad does it feel? And then you get, literally, you get a little tape measure, and you measure, like, where they put their X mark. And you say, that's the utility uh, of that uh, situation. You measure millimeters from the low end uh, to the high end. Now, here's some illustrated utilities obtained from these types of measures. So what, what happened, you know, perfect health is one, 
mild angina, angina is heart pain and, uh, or a, a, a problem in the blood vessels of your, in your coronary arteries, the blood vessels that feed your heart. It can be painful, it restricts your ability to do stuff like walk or have sex, and, it, uh, and you can die from sudden heart attack. Uh, kidney transplant is given a utility of 0.84, severe arthritis, which is saw 0.83. Being on dialysis for the rest of your life, probably some of you have relatives that are on dialysis, maybe some of you are on dialysis. Um, Three times a week, you have to go to a, probably none of you have ever noticed this. Raise your hands if you've ever seen a dialysis center. Just a few of you have. But they're everywhere. So people in our society whose kidneys don't work have to go three times a week to something known as a dialysis center. Now that I've told you this, in the next few months, you're going to go to a mall or someplace, and you'll see a little storefront that has covered up windows, and it'll say, you know, Hoboken Dialysis Center, and in there will be human beings who go three times a week for about three or four hours, and they're connected to a device which cleans their blood, it's an artificial kidney, outside their bodies. And they can't fly to foreign countries easily unless they make plans for dialysis. Uh, they have to make sure that when they land, the next day they get dialysis. Travel is a problem. If you go from one state to another, you have to book ahead and think ahead. It totally alters your life if your kidneys don't work. And this utility of being in that state is judged here to be 0.59. Depression is 0.45, being blind or deaf, 0.39, being permanently hospitalized is 0.33, and of course death is defined as zero. But when the people invented these things, they didn't think that there could be a state worse than death. What do you think? Could there be a state worse than death? Yes, of course there could be states worse than death. What are we going to do with those states? You know, being bedbound in severe pain or being in a persistent vegetative state, which is that you're alive but have no consciousness, right? Well, we need to somehow give negative utilities, and this doesn't quite fit with the utility theory. But you know, we look at this and we say, no, those are worse than zero, some of those states. So now let's look at one way that utilities or health measures might actually be used. So what's the point of all this digression? Well, it provides a kind of numerical way to integrate how whether you live or die and how sick you are. Once again here, there's some duration of time. And then here is health, how healthy you are, or the utility, which we've now introduced. Dead is zero, perfect health is one. And you can imagine one person that you know spends some amount of time in this health state, that has some disease that lowers their health state, another one, maybe they get some treatment, get better, but not quite as much as the beginning. Then they have this duration, then a big sudden drop, maybe a little bit of improvement, and then they drop dead. And this area under the curve is their quality adjusted life here. Or this other person has a longer duration, maybe slower decrements, uh, and then bang, they drop it here. And this person has a different quality adjusted life years. And even though they've only gained this much in lifespan, they've gained all this purple amount in quality adjusted life years. So it's a way to combine and integrate information about the length of life and the quality of life. And, one, and the quality places a weight on time in different health states. So a year of perfect health is worth one, but a year of less than perfect health uh, is, is worth less than one. And they provide a common currency to assess the extent of benefits gained from a variety of interventions in terms of health-related quality of life and survival um, in patients. Now, I mean, you know, I always worry when I do this, this talk in this lecture because, I mean, this is sort of dry, right? It's like, you know, other than the kind of you rather stuff and the bird and all of that, you know, and super smart or super hot, which astonished me the distribution in this class, uh, in that choice. But, um, but, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but one of the things that upsets me about this way of thinking about the topic that we're engaged in is that it's a very kind of antiseptic kind of devoid from the real lived experience of being sick that we also began to introduce the last time when we saw those notes of the people who were killing themselves or the miner who was underground. We kind of had a really upfront intimate or the photographs of the people who were near the end of their lives, like the gynecologist, you know, with his wife. Isn't that an amazing picture of that man and his wife dying for his inner? That's a very different kind of human to human um, experience. And all of these measures might that I've shown you so far today might be called thin measures of health. And here's what a thick description, borrowing an anthropologist Clifford Geertz's famous uh, description, famous uh, term, thick description. Here's a thick description of a health state that comes from the work of medical anthropologist Arthur Kleinman, who was one of my teachers. He 
He describes Alice Alcott, a 46-year-old patient with lifelong diabetes and new onset of heart disease and angina. So we might do the time trade-off method or the standard gamble with Alice, and we might say, oh, her utility is 0 0.5. Let's see what Alice has to say about her life. How was I going to live with this limitation? Hmm. What a burden I would be on my family and friends. I feared becoming the town invalid. I was terribly guilty. I had felt all along that my illness had interfered with my relationships to my children. I never had enough time to give them. I was more preoccupied with myself than with their problems. I was in the hospital at critical times for them. Now I would be nothing but a burden. As far as my husband goes, the guilt was worse. After the chest pain, I feared having sexual relations with him. We became celibate. The claudication, that's a uh, pain in your legs, because the blood supply to the muscles of your legs has been uh, reduced. The claudication, the angina, that's a similar problem in your heart. They interfered with the things we loved. Long walks in the country, birding, climbing, sports. I had to become self-centered in order to control my condition. I felt like a survivor. All I was good for was hanging on. This is totally different, isn't it, than these other ways that we just reviewed of, of measuring and understanding the predicament of patients. And notice again how much this person values the way her health is affecting others. And we also began to introduce that theme even in the last lecture, this notion of connectedness and the social experience and social nature of disease. And this type of description highlights a good question. Isn't it to this that doctors should orient themselves, taking care of this sort of suffering, rather than somehow orienting themselves to the quality level? Right? Do we want doctors to be like flipping switches and adjusting qualities, or you know, utilities, or utiles as they're called? Or do we want doctors to listen to their patients and think, how can I help this person? What can I do different for this person? Now, a final aspect that I would like to know today before I let you go, and I'm going to ask you to ask some questions before I let you go, uh, about the state of health in the modern era is that of what is known as medicalization. And medicalization is a process that involves seeing doctors for progressively less serious conditions. So many of you have probably gone to see doctors for little minor ditzels, a little tiny thing in your mouth, for example, or a pimple. A lot of you probably went to see doctors for acne when you were in high school. This was not something people went to see doctors for 100 years ago, or 30 or 50 years ago, or seeing doctors for non-medical conditions, or the redefinition of such conditions to be under the purview of doctors. So we take things that were not previously the concern of doctors, and now say doctors should be concerned with them. For example, road rage. We tell you have road rage. That used to be seen as a criminal problem, or as a moral failing. And now we're like, you need therapy, uh, maybe medication, to deal with your road rage or seeing doctors for the normal parts of life experience. Grief, for example, right? So if you grieve when someone dies, something I have a lot of personal and professional experience with. And as you know, I was a hospice doctor. I took care of lots of people when they were grieving loved ones. Do you medicate their grief? Who would medicate people's grief? Raise your hands. Give them, like if you could give them an SSRI, antidepressant medicine, to relieve people's grief, would you do it? Raise your hands if you would. Raise your hands if you wouldn't. Right, so it's hard to know. Well, I can leave their suffering. I can prescribe a medicine. Makes them not breathe as much. Here's a crazy example. Uh, there was a, a when women deliver babies, it's very painful. It's often rated as a nine or ten on the visual analog scale on no pain relief. And in the 1960s and 70s, there was a drug that was very uh, useful that induced something known as twilight sleep. Who's heard of this? Yeah. What this drug did. Listen to this freakish thing. What this drug did is it didn't treat the pain, it made the woman not remember the pain. So she delivered the baby, she had all the same pain, but afterwards she thought it was not a problem. I had no problem delivering that baby. <laughs> what, is this, what is this ontological status of such a drug, of such a treatment? Or do we just say, so, and would you treat the pain of women? We would just say, no, actually women have pain when they deliver babies. That's a normal part of experience. Those of you that wouldn't treat, that all of you said, oh, I wouldn't treat grief. That was the majority of you. How many of you would not treat women's pain in labor? No, I'd feel differently about that. Why? Labor pain, grief, both a part of normal experience. Why do you make a difference between those two? 
We'll, we'll touch on these questions. We'll, we'll return to these in the coming weeks. Anyway, all of these are medicalization, the kind of progressive annexation of not medicine into medicine. And many, if not the majority of outpatient visits, going back to your question earlier in the day about my nihilism, I forgot your name in the front row. Oh, Taylor. Taylor. So going back to Taylor's question, many, if not the majority of outpatient visits to doctors do not result in any specific diagnosis being made, let alone a serious illness being detected. <coughs> like 50%, many of you have had this if You go to the doctor and say, my, my, my belly hurts. And the doctor says at the end, you know, I don't know what's causing that, but it's not serious. Let's just watch it. Have you had this experience? Yeah. A lot of times people go to doctors and that's what happens. So people, in fact, may be healthier by some measures, but not feel so good uh, based on others. Here's a list of some conditions that have recently been medicalized. We understand all of these things increasingly in medical terms, whereas formerly we may have understood them as non-medical problems. Premenstrual <coughs> syndrome, ADHD symptoms, erectile dysfunction, baldness, short stature, acne, infertility. Infertility was not seen as a concern of doctors until very recently. Child abuse, substance use, road rage, gambling. We speak of gambling addiction now. That's a new thing. You might, you might go to a doctor to take care of your gambling addiction. Previously, you went to prison or you went to see a priest. Uh, poverty or gun violence or climate change, something we'll also return to at the end of the class. And formerly, these may have been understood as different kinds of deviance, issues of law or crime or religion or sin or moral failing, and not necessarily as issues of medicine or illness. And some of them, in fact, may actually be culture-bound syndromes, some of these things. So, medical, so medicalization is the progressive annexation of not illness into illness. And as sociologist Renee Fox, another one of my teachers, put it in her terrific essay on this topic, health and illness have come to symbolize many positively and negatively valued biological, physical, social, cultural, and metaphysical phenomena. And increasingly, health is coming to be seen as a coded way of referring to any ideal state of affairs. We speak of healthy societies or wellness. We increasingly encompass many things. These medicalized conditions are actually, in my view, also part of the health transition. These are late stage capitalism almost. These are late stage uh, phase four, phase five uh, uh, health transition that we talked about at the beginning of this lecture. And it may even be the case that as mortality has declined over the last hundred years, and as doctors have in some sense had less to do, there has been a compensating rise in medicalization. It's as if because the doctors vanquished illness, we have to have more things that we consider in the purview of doctors because we still need them. Okay, any questions before I let you go about the class or the content or the mechanics? Yes, what's your name? What, well, Rachel? Say that again? The absolute disease centers, we say people are healthy if they lack disease. It just shifts the definition of what we mean by disease. So it's the very, it's the, it was the, it's the first sort of opposite thing. Other questions? About mechanics or content? I'm going to really encourage you to get involved. I'm going to try to learn as many of your, of your names as I can uh, over the course of the semester. All right, see you next time. Uh, we'll have a lot to talk about.